No, thank you for having me. So my name is Helen Mbogwa, and I'm at the Director of Research at Calvert Investment Management, which is part of the Morgan Stanley family, following the acquisition of Eaton Vance back in 2021. So Calvert Investment Management has actually been a responsible investment firm. It's based in the US for the last 40 years, and we are known for being uh, the first um, mutual fund to actually divest outside of, uh, divest from Appetite South Africa, and the first mutual fund to file a shareholder resolution on a social issue. So Calvert's mission is to drive positive change in clients' portfolios, in the companies that we own, and the global communities in which these companies operate. So at Calvert, we think about sustainable fashion by evaluating every stage of the supply chain, from design to material procurement, uh, processing and production, transportation, distribution, and the end of life. So this is why I'm excited about this panel, uh, Can Fashion Be Sustainable? And others that will take place in the coming days. So we share a common goal uh, to find solutions uh, in many of our most pressing sustainability issues. And now I think um, I'll open the floor up for Vanessa. Welcome, Vanessa. Thanks so much to everyone for joining us. And while the panelists get settled, um, I actually have a confession to make. The title of this session is sort of a, a fake because as anyone who has read anything I've written over the last couple of years might know, I actually think sustainable fashion is a contradiction in terms. Um, it's an oxymoron. It's like jumbo shrimp or down escalator or ugly beauty or any of those kinds of words. It doesn't make sense. Fashion is premised on the idea of change and planned obsolescence. And I would really like to replace the use of this term with the idea of responsible fashion. Because I think if you swap out the words and you ask, can fashion ever be responsible? The answer is obvious, right? The answer is yes. It should be responsible starting now. And that's really what we're here to talk about. So joining me immediately to my left is Andrea Baldi, the chief executive of Ghani, the Danish fashion brand that probably everyone maybe owns a piece of in this room. Um, next to him, Claire Bergkamp, the chief operating officer of Textile Exchange. Hector Kesskram, the, uh, wait, you have a long title. Um, <laughs> managing director of UK and Ireland for Longchamp. And then at the very end, Justine Porteri, the Global Head of Sustainability at Depop, um, another place I hope everyone is shopping. Uh, to, to start, I just want to ask all of you, really, how, you take, how we take responsibility for the extraordinary volume of product that this industry is producing and how we think about whether it's possible to scale that back. Because the latest stat I saw was that if growth continues on the trajectory we're on right now, total clothing sales will reach 160 million tons by 2050, which is three times what we're making now. So, uh, Hector. <laughs> Shall I? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay <laughs> <laughs> While we get that sorted out. Um, so I think, I mean, the question around the quantity of new product entering the marketplace is not an insignificant one. The modeling, and we've heard a lot about this already today, I think in different ways when it comes to climate in any industry is um, not in favor if we keep on the growth rate we're on. We can't continue consumption and the production of new products at the rate we're at um, across any industry, and fashion is really at the forefront of that because, um, as Vanessa was saying, you know, we are an industry that is um, it, it, the definition of designed obsolescence. Um, there is new product entering the marketplace daily for some brands, monthly for others. It is enormous, the amount of product that gets pumped out. Um, so I do think that it's time for the industry to really reconsider what and how we uh, enter products into the marketplace, to really think about the durability of those products and not to just have new for new's sake. I think it's great that we have um, Depop on the panel today because 
these new platforms that are encouraging resale um, are very important, as are things like repair. Is this me too? Oh wow, all of us. Um, <laughs> so I think that um, I think this is a great way to start the panel out, honestly, because if we don't do this, if we don't think about degrowth and slow growth, we're absolutely not. We have no chance of um, hitting the 1.5 degree pathway. And so it's the it is the critical question. And in an industry like fashion, it's not an easy one. No. no. <laughs> Degrowth is my favorite word. <laughs> um, Hello. Okay. Okay, nice okay you go next. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, thank you for the question. I think we we start with the responsibility instead of sustainability when we present uh, our uh, responsibility report, because we felt that uh, sustainability and fashion, when you push newness, uh, is been because the consumer wants to actually change. It's not sustainable. And so we cannot claim ourselves to be a sustainable company, but we can try to be a better version of ourselves every day. And that's what the responsibility, I think, argument It's good because it's, it's going to broaden up the perspective and make the sustainable angle more holistic. Because that's what it is when you're facing the sustainability and you start digging into it and you think about uh, the planet and the carbon emission, but then you discover pretty soon that this an ecosystem that is not sustainable itself, and is the way we consume, the way we produce, uh, and the way also the, the the supply chain works, and how the profit of the industry, the profit pool of the industry, is distributed. But uh, I mean, as a producer, how do you rein in your own production? <laughs> Yep. I mean, if, if, you know, if this is sort of the natural thing, is to get bigger and make more and sell yeah, more. Yeah, it's how you decouple, basically, the growth uh, towards the use of uh, materials. And so you, different options you have, obviously, it's trying to prolong and increase the quality. And I think we, we said it's about quality versus uh, volume. So if you increase the quality and you reduce the volume, you can actually increase uh, your in a way, v um, wellness and uh, no, and uh, con value for the entire for the entire industry, uh, but that requires obviously thinking about uh, what's happening in the supply chain. Uh, and when we look at about the consumption of, of a fast fashion, uh, it's not just uh, here in the West; it's actually across the world because uh, people doesn't have access to quality products at the right price. Uh, or because uh, the way which we, uh, as an industry, work towards suppliers is not uh, sustainable. And that's, I think, as a brand, uh, and as especially when uh, we, you have investors that thinks about this in the longer term, you can actually try to reduce the impact, which means uh, you know, passing along a little bit more of your value to the suppliers and try to increase the level, standing, the, the, the level of uh, um, um, uh, living standards uh, that will actually engage a, a, new, a new way of working. The other thing is also, and we, we will talk a little bit more about uh, re-commerce and circular business models, because I think the appetite for the consumer to actually have addition to their wardrobe is not going to disappear. Uh, but uh, you can actually do it uh, in different ways. I think we, we, we collaborate with Depot. We, we believe that the re-commerce can be cool and fun. Um, and there is a way actually also there to keep uh, part of the value that has been created with the first production uh, along the way in the uh, customer journey instead of just focusing on you know, mm -hmm. the first step and the first uh, sale. Hector, how do you think about these questions? Um, yeah. Is it working? Yeah, sure. Um, from our side, I think it's really making sure that the product from the design phase is made to last and made to be repaired as well. So making sure that the lifetime of the product actually is long enough and that it doesn't... Um, that it doesn't break, that you can actually use it for more than a year, you can use it more than two weeks, uh, which is uh, what a lot of people do with the plastic bags that you get at the supermarket. So we really want to make sure that our products are really long lasting. So I was in the factory three weeks ago and we saw a product that was 30 years old that was being repaired. And this is really the kind of thing that we want to keep working on. We've been working on this for almost 75 years now, but we're not gonna stop now because repair is extremely important for the customer, but you don't just repair something that has been badly designed. You repair something that actually has been well designed and made to last and made to also be repaired. So I think the whole design process and production process for us is very important because having an impact on the, back to your question, on the volume of items that are created, it's very important that actually the products are not thrown away after a couple of years, but that they're actually kept and they can be given to other people. They can be resold, they can be you know, thrifted. There's plenty of other things that can happen with the products. So I think that's the main take. But both of you are executives at private companies, yeah. right? So you have a certain 
freedom and and I think ability to kind of control your own production and make maybe controversial decisions, how much harder would that be if you were a public company where you have, you know, shareholders in a market that really is like, okay, no, where's your 19% growth? I think it's a very interesting question. So we're a um, family company even, so it's a very private company. Um, but we work with people, we've been working with suppliers for sometimes 40 years, sometimes 50 years. So leather producers, we actually, we know them, we can work together. And I think the responsibility that you were talking about in your introduction, the responsibility is shared. We don't just put the responsibility on our suppliers because the supply chain is very well integrated. We know these people to their core. Uh, they, they've been knowing us for a very long time, so actually the working together is much easier. So maybe you don't have the pressure of markets and that actually helps with um, delivering great results in the end, uh, but great sustainable results. Mm -hmm. Justine, you obviously have built a business, helped build a business off the excess. <laughs> um, how do you think about this? Yeah. Um, well, to, to build on um, what the rest of the panel has said, I think we, we need to decouple <coughs> the growth of fashion and brands from new products. Um, just to give you a sense of the scale of the issue, we know that about 70% of what's produced ends up um, incinerated or in the landfill. And we're living in times where we, we know we need to be mindful with resources. Um, so there's a lot. <laughs> to do with already. Um, and we at Depop um, love, like we have resale, re-commerce, circularity at the core of what we do. We're a resale marketplace. Um, and I think what has been fascinating and quite positive and optimistic about the rise of business models like, like ours is that it's been spearheaded by the younger generation. Um, most of our users are under 26. And um, what's fascinating is that they are aware of the need to consume less and, um, and acutely aware of, of the overconsumption issues. And they see secondhand as a tool in their arsenals to consume less and consume differently. So we see us and our businesses as a step in the right direction. And what has been pushed and driven by the younger generation now is becoming more and more mainstream. And we love partnering with brands who are trialing those new business models, like Ghani, for instance. Um, recently, we also worked with Doc Martens, Levi's, um, and that gives me hope to some extent. Those are still, it's a little drop in the ocean, but um, brands are paying more and more attention and, and are trialing this. So I think, yeah, to just put a bit of optimism in, in that flood of, of um, waste uh, textile, I think I, I, I wanna also focus on this. Okay, I, I wanna follow up on that with a bit of pessimism, sorry, Go ahead. Um, because Depop is often held up as, you know, an example of the fact that like Gen Z is going to save us and Gen Z loves this and Gen Z is all about secondhand clothes and, you know, yay, we should all learn from that. But Gen Z is also the market for brands like Shein and Pretty Little Things and, you know, sort of the race to the bottom in she fast fashion. So how do you then, you know, swing that group? How do you talk to them and get them to change their behavior? Because clearly you can't just be like, yay, Gen Z will save us. You know, like we <laughs> all need to, to keep working on, on how consumers think about their responsibility in this. Yeah, the, the ambivalence is, is, is there. Um, we know that 45% of our younger users only buy secondhand. Um, so there is a proportion of the younger generation who is actually walking the talk. But as you said, we know that brands like Sheen and, and ultra fast fashion are rising rapidly, um, making H&M and Zara almost look like dwarf at this stage. Um, but realistically, this new generation was born with fast fashion. So they are used to, and we, we, we got them used to that convenience, that speed, that ease, those trends, and being able to see something and buy it the next day and, and buy it through social media now. They, they are used to this. So I think our responsibility as a marketplace, but also generally the fashion industry, is 
how can we help them close what is called the value action gap, what you want to do um, versus what you actually do. Um, and I think doubling down on ease, making it super easy for them to buy secondhand rather than buying new. And that's what we do with, with Depop. Your experience looks and feels like any other e-commerce um, e e shopping experience, but actually you're buying secondhand. So we plant those seeds and hopefully I see this as a Trojan horse of you start with your clothes and then you may rethink another purchase. Maybe when you buy your, your phone next time or you want to buy furniture, you will think, oh, I bought something secondhand, it worked, um, then I can keep going. But people are not going to be able to, they, they won't want to drop on the convenience. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we, we can't fight for that. I mean, I have to say, this, the, the state of the secondhand market right now, particularly as regards to fashion brands, reminds me a lot of the state of e-commerce around um, the sort of turn of the millennium when, you know, a couple brands like Net-A-Porter was founded and, and Ukes was founded, and, but, you know, the luxury brands were just like, oh, no, 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 like, no one is going to buy our products online, haha. <laughs> and now, of course, they've all taken control of their own e-tail, and I wonder if we're heading to a point where every brand is going to take control of its own resale, that the secondary market will be become part of, you know, the, the first market too, that, you know, every brand will own this. And I wonder if Hector and Andrea, you can talk about, you know, is this where you're going? Do you take your products back? Would you resell them? Yeah, we, we have started the pilot uh, of e-commerce in uh, Denmark. I mean, Denmark is one of the uh, highest uh, percentage per population of, uh, of uh, resell and reused. And uh, actually, the, 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 the initial uh, the results are positive, uh, co confirming that the consumer actually not just the younger age, uh, like to be engaged in stores, so more actually physical than digital. <laughs> and, uh, and actually they see this uh, obviously as a, as a choice, uh, but also an opportunity to the stock. And what we see when is this is happening is that um, uh, the community reacts and uh, the stores start having like uh, today 10%, so it's still small, but 10% of our sales uh, in the postmodern uh, is actually on, on e-commerce. And it's, I think it's, it's going to increase, exactly as we saw in e-commerce. When it started, it was just a few percent, now it's 25%. So it's, it's actually believing that uh, you can have uh, a part in the conversation between the consumer when they're going to do on, uh, on e-commerce. And um, I think that that is part of our strategy in terms of decoupling, as I said, the sales uh, from uh, and of new products uh, and, and exploitation of new materials uh, from 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 sales. Uh, and uh, but I also had to add that we have been there because when I was born, my more of my parents were smoking, and I'm not smoking. My kids are not smoking, and that was at the beginning uh, something that was fun and cool, and now it's not anymore because it's been regulated. So we are just welcoming the regulations that I think is needed. Are, are you comparing shopping to smoking? <laughs> <laughs> I'm comparing the, the externalities, externalities that we are creating uh, on the industry with, huh. with similar other industries that has huge externalities that has huh. not been recognized until recently. Yeah. Hector, how, do, you take, do you take your products back? We take them back to repair them. Uh, that's, but not to uh, resell them. Well, we, don't re we try to make sure that actually the product still pleases the customer for a long time. So we also try to steer clear from those fast fashion cycles. Um, so we're recycling around 60,000 products a year, um, repairing, sorry, uh, which is actually a big uh, supply chain effort. Um, for the resale secondhand uh, market, we're, we're trialing. We're trialing in some markets that are interested in it. Well, not uh, all markets are very advanced in that, uh, in that consumption. Um, and yeah, I mean, uh, we're going to uh, launch this year in the UK, hopefully. Um, and we go through a partner. So uh, not uh, the book <laughs> yet, but uh, maybe one day. Sorry. Um, but uh, I think it's very interesting. And I think the advantage of having other brands do it for you is also they have their fan base, they have the customer base, you know, just uh, at the, you know, at a point in time where you have department stores that are also uh, driving the crowds, driving the masses. Well, I'm, I'm a firm believer that those platforms will also drive the masses and will also drive the interest. Um, and they all have a different proposition, a different value proposition. So for brands, it's also very interesting. But wouldn't it be useful data points for, for both of you to actually know, like, okay, this bag was used for X amount of time and then someone wanted to sell it back or wanted to, you or needed to repair it, and this was actually barely used. I mean, it just seems like there's so much information to be gathered from 
the resale market that actually could be could contribute to your own you know sense of what's needed for the future that it you know in the end would would profit you yeah it's also improved the design process because the, all these feedback that sometimes are hard to get it uh, actually are decisions that will influence uh, almost daily how the product is designed so having feedback about durability and uh, usability it's definitely uh, will be very important uh, for us because at the end again is about quality and love lasting uh, mm -hmm. and uh, having the opportunity to use the product more often. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to move on to the idea of standards because I think you know one of the biggest questions is or one of the biggest issues is that this industry has no common standards and um, there have been different attempts to to make them. Most recently, there's been a lot of talk around the Hig Index and you know and their sort of um, numerical assessment of products that has been um, widely dismissed and um, disproved and the Norwegian Consumer Authority just um, suggested that H&M was misrepresent or was that Hig was misrepresenting things. Um, Quartz did an uh, expose on H&M and I wonder if you could talk about how you think about this and whether the kind of legislation that is looming in the United Kingdom, the European Union, the United States will help any of this. Claire? Yeah, it's, is this working? There we go. Uh, I think it's an interesting moment when it comes to legislation. I think the intention that started quite a few years back with the European Commission was to set a baseline through using metrics to put in the same way there's Energy Star on a appliance on a garment. That is much easier said than done. The footprint of a garment is very complicated. Um, I mean, not to put you know, any of our panelists on the spot, but I mean, very few brands know their entire supply chain back to the raw material. Almost none. There is very few companies out there that can tell you, these are the farms I sourced from for all of my products. These are all of the factories it went through to get to me. It is a very complicated system that we're talking about. And so trying to put a single score on a product to represent all of that, all of those externalities, all of those, those different impact levers, are you just measuring climate? Are you measuring climate and water? Are you measuring human rights? All of that is very, very complicated. So I think that the intention that started with the European Commission to have a singular way to measure and understand the impact of products was excellent. However, it is a lot more complicated than that. So I think that some of the, the controversy that's come up is the industry reacting to policy, trying to be proactive to get ahead of what was happening there. But the system, which is a life cycle analysis system, using that you know kind of aggregated global impact of, say, cotton to then put an impact score on a product is very complicated because the global average of cotton may or may not have anything to do with the product you're wearing. Where that cotton was grown, whether it was grown in a water scarce region, in a region that's dealing with desertification, is going to have a huge impact in the uh, impact of that individual product. And so trying to think about cotton holistically and then put that on a product, it is going to be somewhat misleading, which is what we're seeing now as a reaction to what actually started as policy. Policy is reacting to policy, which is interesting. Uh, but I do think the intention is good. And I think that there's a lot happening right now with policy as it's going to relate to fashion, again, around trying to kind of cut out the bottom of the market. When this started, that was the intention. In the same way Energy Star rating started, you know, with uh, D, E, you know, all the way to A, what you saw is those bottom appliances started to drop out and you had A+, plus, A++, plus plus, A++, triple plus, you know, and you started to see the market move up. And that intention is excellent, but the implementation of it, again, is very complicated. And I think, you know, what, what we were hearing, you know, we've got brands that are representing the good in the industry. But what we still have in an industry is an industry that has an enormous amount of disposable fashion. And so there's, you know, there's, we kind of talk about fast fashion as one thing, but there's so much within that. You know, what we can't do is villainize affordable clothing because people need access to affordable clothing. What I think we do need to recognize is that there cannot be any space for disposable fashion if we want to achieve the climate targets that we absolutely have to achieve. And so moving away from disposability and having regulation that supports longevity, that has ex extended producer responsibility, that, you know, helps you know, organizations like these kind of stand out and play in a more level playing field is absolutely critical. And there's a lot that needs to happen here. We need to really help incentivize better action, incentivize better sourcing. And to come back to the kind of original question, I think also certification does play a really big role in that. And so, I mean, we as Textile Exchange run a lot of certifications, to be fair, so I'm a little bit biased, but I do think they're very, very valuable. You know, being able to say that this product was made with a recycled material, this product was made with responsible wool or organic cotton, that is an attribute that can be tied directly back to a product 
that does need to be regulated. We do need to make sure there's no greenwashing, that certifications are actually delivering the value they're promising, but that is a communication that can make sense, I believe, to the marketplace. And really standing behind things that directly relate to the product is where we have to move as an industry instead of kind of broad claims. What actually went into this? You know, is there a chemical certification? Is there a material certification? But, but How does do, this fit do, together? I mean, do you think that consumers really will take the time to understand what all those certifications mean and explore it? I mean, I just, I, yeah. I, I think that, you know, people want an immediate, like, this is good, this is bad, buy this one. I mean, Hector, how do you... Yeah. How do you think about that? You know, how do you communicate what you're trying to do to consumers, or do you not try at all? We do try. Um, so that's the good news. Uh, no, it's very complicated. It's definitely complicated because the customers do want a relatively simple answer. So I think also the process can be complex, but the outcome should be simple. It should be simple to communicate as well. And I think as long as the brands you know, really do the job to make sure that the whole process is sustainable. I think as we were saying, Claire, it's very difficult because um, supply chains are very fragmented. When you produce a lot yourself, it makes things much easier uh, because you know a big piece of the production process. So therefore, it's much easier to communicate on what you're actually doing yourself rather than a faraway factory that you've never been in. Uh, so for us, uh, we really know where the product is coming from. We really know, again, the, you know, the material. We know the producer of the material. So that really helps to communicate and we communicate it with passion. We try to communicate it with passion, but also in a very um, objective way, uh, which is uh, which is quite difficult when you're talking about your own product, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, it's a lot of training for the teams and it's a lot of uh, explanation to the customer, um, trying to keep things simple when actually the, the, the whole process is quite complicated. Um, Andrea, what you talked about adding value to your um, to your products, to making them more, you know, upping the quality. How do you that you presumably that also makes them more expensive? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, so how do you communicate to a consumer who is used to chasing, you know, very affordable fashion, that this is worth it? You know, how do we put the sort of the the genie of value back in the box? I I think that uh, if a, if the product is qualitative and it is quality for long term, maybe that customer will not buy full price but will buy on e-commerce. So the first thing is actually get access to products that are qualitative, no matter if uh, the price may be too high. Um, on the second part, I think is the brand. The two things that we, we see is on one side is the quality and on the other side is the willingness to pay of the consumer. And the willingness to pay of the consumer is based on brand. And so the importance of the brand and having a brand that is, uh, in our case, uh, authentically talking about uh, responsibility in a very honest way, showing uh, all the mistakes that we are doing through the journey, uh, the beautiful struggle of trying to make products that are more uh, responsible. I think that has part of the brand value, and that actually helps also to soften some of the uh, high price points that we may have. Uh, just to remind that the organic cotton is only 1% of the total cotton produced. I th I'm sure that most of you are using organic cotton, so this is not the problem of this room. And that's why sometimes we forget that this industry issues is not actually you know, in London, New York, uh, or in Paris, where we see obviously luxury and brand like us presenting products, but it's really in the completely of the supply chain. And that is, I think, is, is what needs to change. Where, where I think I, I agree with you, we made a big mistakes as an industry trying to find uh, one number that holistically say this is good, this is bad, where we should have be baby steps. And one of the steps I think you have done is this uh, um, certification of material because the material is the biggest part of actually part of the CO2 emission that we see. So if we, we start from that and we have a kind of clarity of what is good and what is bad on material, which is actually the new legislation coming in, Euro in Europe, I think we'll have something to talk to the consumer easier to make choices. Uh, but until then, uh, it's actually each of us needs to do it uh, with their own responsibility. And brand has, I think, brand like us, a uh, responsibility to make clear to the consumer what this stands for. I'm not sure we have time for more baby steps, though, at this point. I mean, I feel sort of feel like the baby step time is, is over. We, we've wasted it. <laughs> uh, Justine, I, just, I want to um, finish with you, and then we're going to open the room up for questions. And so everyone start thinking about what you, how you would like to grill the panel. Um, where do you see this all going? Right? I mean, you, you've sort of, you're at the beginning of the second-hand market. Where do you see the, this going next? I mean, 
the growth of resale is exponential. Um, the number of brands that are trialing or planning to trial, it's about three to four retail execs that say that they're in that position. So I think from this perspective, brighter future, um, I'm incredibly inspired by the younger generation because I see them influencing others. Most of the time, most of the times they, they will influence their family starting to buy second hand. So from this perspective, I'm positive. I think, however, that we cannot rely on the goodwill of more responsible brands like yourselves um, because that is not the issue. And um, as much as there are leaders who believe in this agenda, who truly want to decouple growth with um, pumping new products in the market, we still know that growth forecasts are unrealistic, unsustainable, unresponsible, however we want to label it. So I think we need stringent regulation to make it everyone's problem and not only a nice to have, which from my perspective, it is still the case at the moment. Um, and I love seeing more responsible materials and we need those, but we also not need not to forget that we keep on pumping more. So the bathtub is overflowing and we're talking about mitigating the temperature, whereas we should be stopping the bathtub, trying to, to mitigate the flooding in the bathroom, and then we'll figure out if we reopen the tub. So from my perspective, we, we need strong regulation that will help, but baby steps are there and we need to celebrate those as well. Strong government regulation. Yes. Hmm. Okay. All right, questions from the floor. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> uh, let's start with the one back. Hi. Um, given the whole world, like across sectors, is so driven by the shareholder model, regardless of how stakeholders are coming up, how will this ever change, given that everyone has to be driven to shareholders? It's actually it's a good question. I was thinking about that because of the sort of rise in discussion around ESG considerations as a factor in shareholder investment. Do you guys think that that actually will help with this? I, can I just add? I think there's one key thing that needs to change with questions that investors ask brands. One of the metrics that I hear from companies that they get asked from their invest investors is not only profit, but how much more new product did you sell? Mm -hmm. That has to be a question that gets removed from the annual meetings, from the investor meetings. Profit is one thing. We know that we're in a market where people are beholden to that. So let's just put that to the side for a minute. The thing we could address is that there doesn't need to be the metric of how much more new stuff did you sell. That to me is an easy, easy first step to addressing this issue with investment. I think if I may, as a, as a family company, it's very easy uh, because we're looking at uh, the next generations. Uh, so we're not looking at the next quarter. We're not looking at the next year. We're actually looking at the next generations, even plural. So we are now fourth generation in the business and we're really looking at these, you know, fifth, sixth, all these, uh, all these people that will come afterwards. And if there's no planet anymore, we're not going to sell handbags anymore. So we have to be really careful from now on. So that's very easy. Okay. Uh, yeah, the middle. What are your thoughts on not selling products at all? So I've seen a new trend from clothing stores that I really like to, to shop at that are now trialing renting clothes. Um, is that a, a reasonable you know, business model and would that put your corporations at risk? Hello? We, we, the, we pilot also the rental actually one year before the, the e-commerce because we thought that uh, that's obviously a way of decoupling growth uh, and having repeat uh, sales on the same material. Um, there is some, uh, it's, it's viable. I think it's from a also ecosystem point of view that we tend to think about uh, the, 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 the logistics, but if you think about clusters of cities, that is going not to be a big problem. I think it's the, the problem is the consumer appetite and, and habit uh, to rent product. We see that uh, we put the entire collections, we were really trying to learn is, is what is working, and at the end is, is uh, occasion driven. 
So you are renting for an occasion, you are not renting uh, no, other things, which is actually doesn't make a lot of sense because you are renting uh, your room, uh, you are in the, in the hotel uh, and you don't care if the sheets are new or they are <laughs> recycled, uh, but in reality you are renting only in, in, the, in, that, uh, in that occasion, so the occasion where definitely is as an opportunity. I think as a brand, what, what our end goal is to give the consumer the opportunity to buy, buy second hand or rent as they prefer, exactly like they pay with Klarna, or they pay with Visa, or they pay in cash. I think that is the end game, is to let the consumer actually decide. But on, as a brand, we need also to change a little bit the perception of the consumer on how they need to approach the consumption of fashion, because that is, is otherwise not possible. And that's, I think, brand has a, a reason to exist and try to force that change. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, let's go over here now. So this is the question for Vanessa. Um, <laughs> it's all about influence, and I think y'all are doing a fantastic job in telling your story and influencing your customer, and I also believe in that younger generation. But Vanessa, um, what is the responsibility of a journalist, in particular fashion journalists, whether it is um, glossy magazines, or once they were glossy magazines, or newspapers? Um, and how can the appearance of an editor influence the crowds? Do the fashion editors traditionally, as they always appeared in their newest clothes, does that still have to be the case or not? Uh, I don't think fashion editors are the biggest influence anymore at all. Um, I think uh, Love Island contestants are the biggest influencers. <laughs> um, and, you know, as we found out last night, or discussing last night, um, Love Island is now being sponsored by eBay. So that is all for the good. Um, no, I think, you know, one of the biggest questions, and this is an issue for journalists, but it's also an issue for all of us, and we were talking about it um, before the panel, is that the storytelling around responsibility and what everyone's role is and the information flow is really complicated, and I don't think any of us has figured out the right way to talk about it widely, not to the people in this room who are the converted, but to all the people outside of this room who are not the converted. Because the truth is, you know, these, these ideas, chemistry, waste, factories, fibers, landfill, garbage, like this is not sexy words, right? Like nobody really gets excited about reading stories about this. And that to me is the biggest challenge. And you know, the only way I've found to approach it this far is to really look at the people involved in it and the kind of human stories behind it, whether it's supply chain or production or purchasing. But I do think it's an enormous challenge. And if any of you have any ideas, I am very open to them. <laughs> brilliant panel. Most of what we wear is fabrics invented by the Victorians to be handed down to your great-grandchildren, denims, uh, cottons, or, and the only innovation in fabric recently has been, hey, let's make clothes out of plastic. Um, where is the radical uh, innovation within the industry? You know, when we think about oil and gas versus renewables, where's the renewables of the, of the industry? Or are we going to continue to make everything out of fabrics designed to last longer than we do. I'm sorry, I want to tweak that question a little bit before these guys answer it, because I do think there's a lot of innovation going on, but the real question is where is the scale behind the innovation? Because it's great to make 10 handbags out of, you know, plant-grown vegan or plant-grown leather, but it's not going to move the needle. It's not going to change our problems. Being able to do it at scale is going to change our problems. Yeah, I think that's right, and I think that um, that, that has to be the first step. So what you're, you're saying, that's right. I mean, 52, 54% of all the fibers used right now are polyester. That is how fast fashion came to be what it is. You can't have fast fashion without polyester. It is a plastic. Right now, the way it's made when it's recycled is from plastic water bottles. It is not circular. It is extending the life of one waste, but creating another. That is the most scale we have. 14% of all polyester is recycled. So that's the best we're doing, and it's not even our own waste stream as an industry. 
But scaling up the solutions that we have now is the first step, and then scaling up innovation is the next step, because the innovations that we see, which are absolutely to your point, where we need to get to get to this next level, are not available right now. And we don't have, there's no more time for baby steps, there's no more time for waiting. There are solutions now that we know can work. We have to scale recycling, we have to deal with textile to textile waste. Only 1% of all textiles are re-recycled back into textiles right now, that is in a, sh a horrible figure. We need to do so much better than that as an industry, so to me, that's where the focus on innovation needs to be, is in the systems that we currently inhabit, not just walking away from them for the sake of innovation, because the innovations are five, 10 years down the road, and we don't, we can't wait for them to be available for production. Um, just on that subject, I'd like to kick a question over to Hector and Andrea, which is, do you think when you're designing a product, do you think about what happens after? You know, it's second use, it's end of life. Like, do you design for, recycling, do you design for disaggregation or is that not something that you're thinking about at the moment? Because, you know, it's great to have a fabric that can, that can be recycled, but not if it's got lots of zippers and plastic sequins yeah. all over it. We, we went through a process of training our, our designer on circularity. And I think what we get out of it, uh, again, is uh, the sizing adjusting, for example, the tweaks that we can do of the products so that they can actually have a longer life cycle and follow the consumer and actually when they are on second market still keep the value. So there are tweaks that you can do. The real thing is that if you want to build the product for completely circularity uh, end to end, uh, it's going to be extremely boring because the innovation is not there and the options that the designer has is really few. So the, within the one part is the innovation part and the other part is the consumer thinking beyond just the first purchase, which is at the end, it's actually as a business model what we need to do, what we need to do. Yes, we think about it all the time as well. I mean, it's uh, typically a wallet, for instance. Uh, you can either glue it inside or you can stitch it. And stitching it makes it much easier to recycle afterwards because it's much easier to open and take apart. So we think about these things all the time. It's extremely important. And also for the repair side, also goes there. OK, I think you have time for one more question. Let's go over here. Um, you've you've touched, touched on it a bit. Um, I want to understand a bit more about how we change the consumer's mindset, right? Because you've just mentioned the Love Island and eBay partnership, which is obviously probably helping Depop quite a bit. Um, how do we, how do you as brands and, and, and leaders in this industry, how do you work as a collective to change the fact that, that purchasing is a trend and the fast fashion is because of, of runways and, and magazines and, and this being on trend and, and trying to follow those footsteps. How do you work as a collective to, to change that and to make buying Depop or partnerships with eBay and things like that more on trend? Justine? Yeah, so I, yes. <laughs> um, I think, well, the beauty of, of Depop is that it made, and our community made buying secondhand cool. Um, before us, they did that. And um, realistically, it's about not so much shouting about the sustainability aspect about it, but making it aspirational. And also, again, decoupling the trends from the newness, our community and the younger generation, they don't see new, newness as inherent to a brand new product. It can just be new to me. It will give me the same feel good um, feeling and it won't hurt as much the planet. So, so I think rather than trying to fight the trends, because inherently you're trying to change behaviors and we know it's incredibly hard, tapping into those and channeling that energy in better, um, on towards better products, products that already exist or that are, ma are manufactured better, this, you're more likely to be successful this way. And um, one thing that is beautiful about Depop is that we see now trends coming up from the bottom up rather than top down. And so those are the things that give me hope. It's actually really interesting. Last night, Glenn Martins, who's the creative director of Diesel, said that when he took over the brand, one of the things he decided is they were going to have a runway show, but the only things on the runway were going to be garments that were upcycled, that were made from upcycled materials. So everything on his runway was made from old stuff, even though it looked new. 
I just maybe coming back to where we started with degrowth. I mean, one of the tenets when people talk about degrowth is um, also thinking about what and how we communicate to the marketplace and the role that advertising plays in that. And actually, it was interesting. Solly, um, who's here, get a, did a great TED talk at TED Countdown about the kind of silent industry that is advertising. And I think that part of this movement, part of this change, has to be responsible advertising. I know that there's work that's been happening in the UN around what is a 1.5 degree aligned advertising and communication pathway. So what is it to responsibly communicate as a brand buying new? How much do you really push that into the marketplace? Because we are in a cycle and in a system where new is desirable and the more new the better. And the advertising industry and the communications industry has a huge role to play in this transition and it shouldn't be up to a single brand, but I do think that there needs to be in the same way we're talking about reduction in emissions in our manufacturing, in our supply chains. What does it mean to be responsible in our communication and keep in line with a 1.5 degree mindset and really shift that not only in the product, but in the way we communicate it? And on that note, I am going to communicate that sadly our time is up. <laughs> but um, thank you all for joining us. Thank you to the panel. Thank you. And thank you.